Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Claire Laver, and I'm the executive director of Make the World Better Foundation in Philadelphia. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, it's really an honor to be part of BPHL, and we really want to thank Dan, Beth, and the whole BPHL team for putting on such an inspiring festival this week. And thank you as well to David Neff, Adam Engelhardt, and the whole team at Neff for presenting our talk today. Uh, we're very appreciative of our partnership, as always, and for this opportunity. And I also want to acknowledge and thank my team, Sydney, Steph, Ken, and Joey, for all of your hard work leading up to this session and to our panel participants. We're, we're so glad to have you with us. And we're very excited uh, for all of you joining us today to meet them shortly, so thank you. Uh, we also want to invite you to use the Q&A function to ask any questions that arise during the course of our session. Uh, Hope from the NEF team will be helping to monitor the Q&A and she will push questions to our panel once the Q&A portion of the session begins, which will be around 4.45. Um, to start, I want to share a bit about uh, Make the World Better. Um, so MTWB is a nonprofit organization in Philadelphia centered around connecting people and inspiring stewardship through public space revitalization projects. To date, these projects have primarily been focused around public parks, playgrounds, and recreation centers. So one clear end result and goal of our work is the building of new infrastructure. We believe firmly that all people deserve access to high quality recreational facilities. However, quite importantly, we view these design build processes as vehicles for community building and elevating the power of collaborative design and rebuilding processes. This process seeks to upend the more traditional top-down model where design team members, city agencies, and elected officials are often viewed as experts and community members may only be given episodic opportunity to weigh in on the process. But we view community as the true stewards and experts of their home park. Many community members view these spaces as a second home. Uh, many important life milestones have been reached and connections formed within these shared public spaces. And in redesigning these public amenities, it's not only important to capture the aura or the essence of the community and design, but to ensure that the components of the new design and the new build reflect both the current community's needs and also dreams that they have for how they may grow into the space in the future. So when we enter a project, we ask our whole team, our MTWB team, our design team members, engagement partners and city partners to all come to the table with humility and to listen first, working to ensure that the voices heard loudest through the process are those of community members. Uh, MTW, MTWB also works closely with all of our project partners, including city and design partners, to ensure that what's being designed meets operations and maintenance standards of the city, and also that the project stays within budget. So that piece can often be a challenging aspect, what I often like to describe as sort of finding the center of a complex Venn diagram. Uh, but this model, again, centering community in design is something that can and should be applied across the board to projects big and small. And we, we hope that wherever you are and whatever the nature of your work, there are elements of this process that you hear about today that you can implement in your own work and within your own communities. Um, so before we get to our panel, um, we would like to show you a brief video produced by our partners at NEF, featuring some of the folks you'll see shortly on the panel and also featuring one of our founders, Connor Barwin, uh, who along with Margaret Bailey and Jeffrey Tubbs uh, initially founded the organization during Connor's first season playing for the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, which was his fifth season overall in a 10 year career playing in the NFL. And he's now working in the front office with the Philadelphia Eagles where he is right now. Um, so I'm happy to play this video for you to give you a bit more context on our work. And then we will uh, set up the panel. The goal is to create safe spaces for kids to have artistic and athletic places to explore and play. You know, when you really get, get into it, Philly is, is a city full of neighborhoods. It's a diverse city, city full of hardworking people. 
A park should be a place that, you know, where you see joy every single day. And that's what we're trying to do. A park is, is a safe place. It's a community center. It's a place where a neighborhood can come together. It's a place where kids can grow and develop. It's a place where people can, can meet and hang out and relax. What we've learned is not only to, you know, design any kind of public space with the neighborhood, because they are truly kind of the experts of their space, but you want to design something that works for everybody. It'll be forever known as a top. It's not a day that you go by that you won't see somebody utilizing that park. And it's been like that for as long as I can remember. It's important for everybody to come to the park, especially the older people, like the ones even older than me. Because we have history, and we could pass that history down. Like everybody has a story. When I seen what they did, the 20 feet tasking, I was like, wow. And when it happened to us, I was more wow. Next thing I know, they had a concert, they raised the money, we had groundbreaking. Next thing I know, I asked for a wish and I got it. Yo, yeah, they did a fine job. My name is Edwin Desmore. Uh, I like to consider myself a Waterloo resident. The neighborhood's been through its ups and downs. We're pretty much in the heart of that opioid epidemic. This is sacred ground. Like, we don't want it in here. You hear basketballs, you hear splash, and uh, you hear kids playing tag and running around. And this is what it's supposed to be. Waterloo is getting some attention now. People are giving it the attention that it rightfully deserves, you know, and people are feeling loved. Make the World Better is like a, a crazy, weird, unique nonprofit that brings together the worlds of professional sports, you know, concert goers themselves, all under this one umbrella that has raised a tremendous amount of money that I'm unaware of anything else like it in the country. The foundation has grown as the parks have grown. Now we're at the beautiful Delft, which is a, you know, a city venue um, where we get a great deal here so we can raise as much money as possible. This is the way you know, we support the organization. We go out and leverage the funds raised at this concert uh, through the public and private sector to help pay for these projects. So moderating our discussion today will be Ken, da Ken Tomzuk, MTWB's Director of Design and Engagement, and Steph Garcia, MTWB's Engagement Coordinator. And our panelists who are key design and community partners of ours will be introducing themselves momentarily as well. Uh, so I will now turn the session over to the panel group and to Ken who will be introducing and setting up our panel discussion for today. Thank you. Thanks, Claire, and hi, everyone. Um, I am Ken Tomzuk, Director of Design Engagement at MTWB, as Claire mentioned. Um, and uh, I'm here today with uh, Steph Garcia, our Engagement Coordinator, and a number of our uh, community partners. We thought that the best use of time today would actually be to facilitate a conversation uh, with groups of people who um, have worked together so that we could um, share some ideas about things that have worked and haven't worked in uh, a non-traditional design process. And so I think we could start by just introducing moderators and panel. Um, and I'll just call on everyone uh, for this section just so it's an ease of facilitation. Um, Steph, could you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Steph Garcia. I'm the engagement coordinator for Make the World Better. Thank you. Tracy? Hi, I'm Tracy Edgerton, and I'm um, a resident of the Point Breeze area. Thank you, Edwin. 
Hi, I'm Edwin Desmore. Uh, I'm a Waterloo Playground, but also part of the Make the World Better family. Thanks, Evan. And Ian. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ian Smith. Um, uh, I am an architect. I'm working with MWTB on uh, one of their playground projects as a uh, the schematic design team. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. So um, we thought it'd be really great to have this panel of folks together because um, they represent um, some different points and perspectives in the overall MTWV process. Um, so Ralph Brooks in Point Breeze, as Tracy mentioned, um, is a park that um, had the the major capital investment uh, completed and construction completed a few years ago. Um, Waterloo Playground in West Kensington uh, that Edwin is representing is about to embark on construction. Um, and Vera Recreation Center in Grace Ferry, uh, where Ian is the architect, uh, is still in the early stages of design. Uh, so I think we'll be coming to the conversation with a few different perspectives. Um, Ian, could we start just uh, by asking you to share with us from, you know, from the perspective of community participation and how the process at Mayor has been similar and different from other projects you've worked on or are, or are currently working on? Yeah, um, so, you know, as far as what architects are supposed to do, um, you know, we are supposed to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public, you know, in the stewarding of producing, whether it's new construction or you know, adaptive reuse or interior innovation. And in some ways, our service is always supposed to be about listening and being humble. And um, in some ways, you know, no matter who our client is, we're trying to serve um, in the best ways of you know, getting that information out of their heads and trying to translate it into a way of putting it on the paper. So, um, so in, in the best sense, it's not much different. I think. In contrast to that, um, uh, as uh, I think Claire um, had recently sort of described in the capacity of what you know MWTB does to do, and generally the current trend of what we're trying to do in the city of Philadelphia is to um, really start from the grassroots, from the street, and, and bring in those narratives and those stories, which are generally left um, to the last place, or their add-ons, or more superficial in, in its in its nature, and um, I think, um, in general, when including more uh, voices within the design process, it's a little bit more complicated, a little bit more messy, um, and uh, and clearly does require more time in order to facilitate. Uh, so, um, in that sense, you know, patience and. Uh, and spending time and embedding is probably the most important part that makes it a lot different than a typical design process. Thanks for that framework, Ian. Um, it's helpful. Uh, Tracy, you have lived um, and community organized in Point Breeze for a number of years. Um, could you sh share a bit about uh, your experience between the differences with working with MTWB and maybe some more historical uh, top-down city development processes where the community um, might not be directly consulted? Thanks, Ken. Again, um, my name is Tracy Anderson, and I have been a resident in Port Breeze area in South Philadelphia for the last 59 years. Um, my experience with MTWB is definitely different than any other experience I've ever had when it comes to development in that area. Um, more community involvement, more opportunities for people in the community. The engagement process, engagement with the community is awesome. I'm working with MTWB, is welcoming, and um, people just gravitate to that. You can, you know, you have that feeling, you get that feeling when you're welcome. Unlike some of our other historical things that are going on that the city has developed, especially when it comes to the housing industry. As a housing um, employee, some of the houses that brownstones that we used to have in our area are gone. Our mom and pop stores are gone, but yet the community had no involvement at, in the process of how to purchase those properties or what should go up next. So we get kind of like pushed out. Even if we go to those 
meetings, those zoning meetings, the community is never there at the table to decide what's this look like and what's development. So working with MTWD has been magnificent. Well, thank you for that, Tracy. It's, it's been great working with you as well. Um, Edwin, now similarly in the Waterloo community, you have been a longtime resident of Kensington in the Fairhill area. And in many ways, you and fellow community members have really spearheaded the re revitalization of the playground and made it a safe haven for youth again. Um, I'm just curious that after you started your work at Waterloo Playground, why did you decide to partner with MTWB? Um, first of all, it, it, it was a, a no-brainer. I mean, it was good energy. Uh, first folks that I met, it was Claire and, and Jeff, and it was just great energy. Um, just straightforward that I met Connor also, uh, who came out and he doesn't walk around with an entourage or nothing like that. Uh, he came on in and sat down and, he, you know, so to sit back and watch him walk around and engage the youth and, and, and speak with the youth. But it was a no brainer at the end of the day. Each person they assigned or, or, or assigned as a liaison toward me uh, from Make the World Better were great folks, you know. Um, Communities uh, uh, struggle a lot with trying to trust folks. But mm -hmm. when you sit there and say, okay, any minute now, this person's going to break after running into many different personalities. But to see, they're still human, but to see that they took some things on the chin to show consistency of, of, of being there. And I think it was a no brainer to say yes, but also for the community to say yes, because you know what? They're coming out here and uh, we put them to the test and they're still here. <laughs> well, thanks, Edwin. I mean, I feel like we have learned a lot from you and community as well. Um, and it's a pleasure every time we go to Waterloo to work mm -hmm. with you and the advisory council or the youth. Um, Tracy, I mean, Ralph Brooks Park was like the first park that MTWB really took on. I'm curious what you expected working MTWB like, you know, when Connor and Jeff first showed up and then Claire joined. Can you tell us about some of your hopes, your fears, and just your thoughts around that process? So, yay for Ralph Brooks being the <laughs> first part. Um, what really worked was the welcoming uh, kind of energy from the beginning, from the first time I met him. As everyone stated, his energy was good. And this is ability to be open and listen to the community was a mm. breath of fresh air. Yeah. The great community involvement, you know, um, he never shut us out from the process. Right. So just the ability to listen gave us hope. Wow. What, yeah. um, what could have improved, um, and maybe it's a lack on our community's part, was more community involvement, where we could have like had um, maybe some internship opportunities for some of the younger residents in the neighborhood. They mm -hmm. were kind of like didn't get involved in the process. And I don't know how we could have changed that when I look back, how the younger people could have gotten involved in the process. Because they'll be the ones that carry on uh, the legacy of the park. So I played in there when I was young. So for me, I'm getting older, so I'm hoping that one of the younger kids, when I get that old, will take me over to the park and still maintain it. So I don't know what we can do, but I'm, we kind of like missed out on that part of getting the younger generation involved in the process. Thanks, Tracy. Yeah, that's, that's helpful to understand. Um, and I think it's a really good point in thinking about some of the intergenerational elements of the work that we all are doing together, um, trying to get youth, adults, and elders uh, together to work on projects and programs. And I think um, it's a helpful transition that you're making um, around some of these experiences and like successes and challenges. Um, so I, Ian, I'm curious from a design professional background, what's the biggest challenge uh, that you faced working in this kind of process um, at there? Um, I have to say, like, you know, I think when we as a group try to work together, I think among all design professionals, it's 
bringing all those personalities together. And I think there's a natural desire to be inclusive and polite. And there's a real balance that has to be taken with regard to design, because in some ways you can never make a decision um, when you start to bring um, so many variables forward. And they just kind of they continue to move around and around um, without um, being able to prioritize things. And I think, um, you know, without the deadlines, sometimes um, it, it generally um, puts us into an sort of uncertainty kind of place. And I think in, in some capacity, um, um, just because of the way, you know, the program in which we're working with is structured, it prevented us from being able to um, have the hard boundaries that typically um, form design projects, like having a hard schedule um, um, for one, and then having other things that might really impact how you design, whether you know, you're keeping a building or you're removing a building, um, you know, making space available. Um, and if those things, um, you know, how they can mutate, how we can be flexible. Um, if, you, if you don't have real good determinations in those capacities, it's really hard to uh, come up with something that people can relate to in some capacity. It's always kind of in between. And I think in general, when you deliver something that's in between to the community, um, it's kind of get the in-between back. You don't really get hard answers either. So um, it generally puts us all in this kind of uh, uncertainty zone and and unable to commit in some capacity. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, it's helpful to, to hear uh, about some of those uncertainties um, and how you are navigating that discomfort. Um, and I think your point around deadlines and timelines uh, is really informative. And I would actually love to hear Edwin's thoughts on that as someone who, um, Edwin at Waterloo, uh, we know that these projects and partnerships take time. Um, and kind of a two-part question for you, has it been a challenge to keep community members engaged? Um, and if so, how have you managed to keep momentum um, considering the length of time that the project is taking? I think the same approach that I took with uh, the communities, the, the, the same type of approach you, you take with a, a loved one, a family member, who you just want to keep encouraging, you know, to, to move forward. You know, uh, folks are going to knock on doors for job interviews and it might not happen. But then, you know, you have to step on in and say, hey, we got some more doors to knock on. Uh, we still, we, we got to stay positive. You know, when I think about my children, when I got to keep them focused, and, and keep them motivated and keep them uh, looking forward. It's the same thing uh, with the community. Uh, you just gotta take it as one big family, uh, but also understanding that, you know, it's not just about partnerships, it's really making someone feel like they're part of a community. So when you see someone walking down the block, you should be able to have a relationship so good that you know that something's wrong today something's off because you're familiar with their characteristics, you're familiar with their energy. But once you see it down, and you can see their faces, you know, if they come on in and say, hey, uh, what happened? I thought this was going to take place at this time. And when you give an explanation, you could tell or feel the energy that happens. Maybe something just, just came right out of them, like, wow, um, this is never going to happen. But if you know that and if you feel that, don't let that conversation stay that way. You know, let, let, let's finish talking. Let, let, let's explain it, you know, but it's okay for you to feel the way you feel. You know, and if it does happen, if it doesn't, this doesn't mean that you give up hope on your community and, and your family and who you are. We still have to move forward, but do understand that there's a process for everything. There's a process and you have to be involved all the way. And yeah, thanks, Edwin. Um, that process, Tracy, um, sounds like it might be good to bring you in here again, uh, just thinking about some of the work that's happened at Ralph Brooks, um, where some projects that MTWB partners with community members on are single uh, public space park or playground projects. At Ralph Brooks, uh, there are a series of lots that contribute to kind of like a, a complex of public spaces. Um, and thinking about uh, these relationships that Edwin is talking about, I know you're someone who has a lot of relationships with people in the community and that you are uh, not scared to let people know when they are doing something that should not be done at Ralph Brooks Park. And I'm wondering, um, you know, based on this conversation around timeline, 
Do you think that there are opportunities with um, some of the work that we're, we're doing together at the mural lot to um, connect with youth and bring youth into that work moving forward? Uh, definitely, definitely with the youth. Uh, one of the main attractions over there that they're anxious about, and it's not just the younger kids, it's the, that middle age generation um, is the bars, the fitness center. You know, there's a lot of excitement about the fitness center. Uh, how do how do they get the, in the fitness center? Is it going to be a time frame? Oh, you know, there's a lot of questions going on. So we want that space over there to be handled by generational people. So, okay, so I probably the oldest person over there, Ralph Brooks now. So we also want that uh, millennial kid to be involved, and then we want the younger kids to be involved. So, and they understand that things take time because that's our, that's my words to them. In time, things, it'll be done. You know, we watched that. We watched how the developers came over and started digging off from that time. My phone was ringing, I was at work. And they said, hey, they started the process, Ms. Tracy, we're on our way. So I'm keeping them in the loop with me because I don't want to be the one that actually has to be over there every time it's open or when that process. So they're all already thinking about ways that they can utilize it and the involvement process. So I'm glad that our community um, loves that idea, the concept of what's going on over there, and they're willing to be involved. Yeah, no, that's really wonderful, Tracy. And I always enjoy calling you on the phone and talking about, you know, what, how the kids can get involved, what's going on in the neighborhood, you know, everything that's going on with Ralph Brooks in general. Um, I think, you know, we can't really talk be on a panel or have a conversation without acknowledging the year that 2020 has been. I mean, my gosh, it's been quite a year to say the least. Um, Ian, I'm wondering, in the midst of this global pandemic and racial uprisings, what role do you think community different public space projects can play in health and racial justice? Big question. <laughs> yeah, we'll love it. I know. Um, yeah, so it's a doozy. I think, you know, I mean, like, ultimately, there are, you know, there's so many, there are as many agendas as there are in order to solve this problem. You know, there are people to, to, to go after it. And, you know, and in some ways, you know, the hope is that we can all work together with our, you know, some directives in mind um, that we want to uh, help to solve this. Uh, I think. You know, as you kind of said, I mean, like this is, you know, Black Lives Matter and the George Floyd stuff. I mean, that, this is a public health issue as much as it is anything else combined with COVID. Um, and uh, the truth is, it's just unearthed what we um, kind of never really addressed as a public health issue with regard to these neighborhoods and what's happening these days. So in some ways, it's it's hopefully shedding light on it. And we know that when things are put in the light you tend to you're able to help make them more healthy and um, just by sort of identifying um, where problems are we can have people come into play where we can begin to solve them which is basically the basis of design defining the problem right the hope is that we can define the problem correctly right it's often that it's a top-down situation much like we described before in order to define the problem appropriately we may need to think outside the problem, use these wonderful skill sets of um, philosophical sort of rumination on, like, who is the author? You know, is the author reliable? How can we unpack those things in real ways? What do, what do the words that we're using really mean? And can we turn that language into the correct perspective um, in order to drive the right questions. Um, I think it's simple to say that if, you know, you come from a place that does a lot of walking, you may need to solve the problems through an ambulatory or walking kind of perspective um, versus trying to solve it with a vehicle perspective in, per right. in, per in, in some sense. Or let's just say there is, and like in, in Bear's case, I think this is probably the most um, troubling is that, you know, there are psychological boundaries um, that prevent young children from 
traveling from one place to another. They cannot cross certain streets without expecting to have conflict in some way. And um, focusing your, our attention on that public health issue helps to then focus our attention on um, things that grow from that that might impact the overall challenge when it comes to COVID-19 as well as Black Lives Matter, right? As opposed to thinking about it as a infrastructural thing with regards to police brutality. Maybe it's something far more nuanced that's clearly overlooked because, it, because of the nuance. Nuance is messy. Most people can't deal with it. It takes time to deal with. And you have to unpack that. So I hope I answered the question. I kind of yeah. Yeah, um, I think went, you did. went for it. Yeah, I mean, it is, is, it is a very complicated question. I don't know if there is one answer, but from what I hear you saying is there's so many invisible systems or boundaries or things in place. And in some ways it is about making those visible and really beginning to deconstruct them. Um, and the use of language, you know, not just design language or visual language, but actual verbal language is important as well. Um, Edwin, I feel like, you know, you are a trained facilitator. You've worked with so many organizations and have had these difficult discussions that are needed. And you've also worked on a lot of community-driven public space projects. I'm wondering what effects our partnership has had on your community so far and what effects you hope it will have in the future. These can be positive, these can be negative, um, any of that, any of your thoughts on that? Well, the partnership, and, and when, it, when I really think about it and break it down and, and now so long, I was speaking to some uh, community folks, reaching out to them. Um, you know, certain things that transpired in the community when folks were concerned about uh, security and issues mm -hmm. around the playground because they were so afraid of it going back to a certain way. So when I explained to them about the process of me reaching out to sort of make the world better, to, to help me uh, uh, be a voice for the community, uh, I, I, issues with the rec center, issues with safety, um, there was no hesitation. Um, you know, folks were involved. Folks were involved um, from you, Ken, uh, Claire, you know, uh, were emails that were just like, you know, just, just gathering folks' attention, just saying, hey, we, we need assistance down here. Uh, that part means a lot when you have people willing to say, hey, I'm, we have a platform and we're, we're going to help be a voice for you because these folks have been calling and reaching out and no one's right. listening to them. So now they get to say, we know people. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, that's an awesome partnership. And that is something that, that should, in my opinion, that should be a model for many other folks. You know, just don't stay in your comfort zone. We just do this. You know, mm -hmm. let, 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 let's think outside the box and let's try to go above and beyond of what we can do, you know, and, and take that time out. Uh, some of the lessons that I've learned to make the world better, for example, today, I spent most of my day uh, going into homes, trying to help children log on to classes, which is very difficult. But me going to the home, there was a lot of trash in the streets. I had to walk in the streets just to get to the home, just to go inside. So for instead of me just going there just to help log in, and I had to turn around and say, did you hear about 311? You know, you could take a picture of this. And they said no. So I had to sit down with them, which is out of my job description, right. to say, hey, Let's download this. Let's go. You got five or seven residents in the neighborhood coming over and saying, "Hey, can I download that also?" And when you say that there's there's power in numbers, so the reason yeah. I'm bringing that up is this is the same approach that Make the World Better does. It's the same exact approach. What, how can we sit down with you? We're not just going to hear you and say, "Wow, it's a shame," you know, or "Wow, uh, let's talk about this next meeting." Let's get involved now and um, let's see what we can do to empower you. Empower you. Yeah as a community, so I um, hope that answers your question. No, yeah, it did, and yeah, the community empowerment, I mean, you've been such a pivotal figure in really helping, you know, us elevate the Waterloo community voice, because, I mean, you're right, it's there, and, you know, they, they need to be given up. 
Thank you. Uh, and I just want to know from Ms. Case, who has come into the, the, the virtual room. Um, Ms. Case is a lovely VARA community member. She is the facility caretaker of VARA Recreation Center and has been a part of the community, at least for the VARA Rack Center, for more than 10 years. And it's just a wonderful joy to be here. Um, in this case, we are nearing the end of our time, but um, I just wanted to ask you a question before we close. Um, you know, we, we just started our partnership with VARA Rack Center in 2019, so a little bit over a year ago. Um, and I was just wondering if based on the partnership that we have had, though it has been very brief, um, what hopes do you have for our continued partnership in the future for, for their rep? Uh, what hopes do I, do I have? Yeah, hopes. Um, based, well, my hopes is that once our project is done, that y'all will still be, you know, involved with the community and share with us the, um, just the, how can I say, the, um, the overwhelming and difference that hopefully that uh, the new VAIR will bring to our community. It's been a long time coming and we've been divided for many years and we're starting to come in as a community. Our, our neighborhood is changing and hopefully it's changing for the best. And if, you're, if um, your foundation is still around and you know, I, well, I'm quite sure y'all still will be around but just to come in and, you know, still help us and enjoy what we have here. Well, we'll have. We hope to be around if you'll have us, Miss Case, because it's it's been such a joy working with all of you. And, you, know, you know, I will. <laughs> and the same thing goes for, you know, Waterloo <laughs> and Ralph Brooks Park and all our parks in general, whether they, you know, are being built currently or the ones that will be built in the future. And I think we may open it up to Q and A now, unless Ken has any further questions. I do have one more question for Miss Case. Uh, hi, Miss Case. Good to see you. I, Hello. Um, I just would love to hear um, from you know your early like our partnership, our early partnership with MTWB and Bear, um, and also your work with Ian um, being in the same room at Bear. Um, during like workshop nights and knowing what those conversations are like. Uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what's working and what is maybe not working so well and could be improved. Well, one thing I would love to say, thank you, thank you, thank you for including us in this new rebuild. I mean, I, I can't say it enough. I mean, y'all could have came in, tore down, and put up whatever you wanted. But instead, you asked the community for their feedback. You diligently been, you know, back and forth with the feedbacks, trying to get everyone to feed in and bring ideas um, to the table. Um, I guess the only thing that I can say that is that I'd just be glad when it's up off the ground, <laughs> when it, you know, gets in uh, the making and, you know, all the ideas that we've put forth comes to play. Thank you, Ms. Case. But I, um, I can't say, I have to say thank you and thank you over again for letting us be a part of it. Um, thank you. Um, Ms. Case is someone who is always an inspiration to our organization. Um, and every time we have a conversation, Ms. Case, I'm really uh, excited and just inspired by the level of honesty that you bring to the conversations. Um, and I think as the last question for the panel, um, 
you know, we do have conversations about uh, race very directly um, in some of the workshops at VAIR. And Ian, uh, I'm curious um, your thoughts on how those conversations, um, what they've been able to bring out um, and what it's been like uh, partnering with, you know, Miss Case and the rest of the VAIR community on the process. I mean, I'd say that, you know, I've, you know I've, I've been in this field for about 25 years, right? And, you know, I'm navigating it in the sense of code switching, you know, for the, you know, the authority class. I, I, you know, in, in lack of a better word, I could say I've been trying to be white in order to navigate that realm in some capacity. Um, but, you know, I also know that, you know, in order to um, work in these communities, there is trauma that you have to work through. And if you can't sit there and understand that people have to get through the trauma first in order to get to the ideas, you're not, you're not going to get very far. Mm -hmm. And um, you do have to get through it. And it is challenging. Um, much like trying to get through a boardroom that is really energized and aggressive, you've got to sit through, you know, all of the conflict and get to the good part, right? I think it was, I think it's been fabulous. These are the kind of things that have to happen. And we can't be afraid to be in the room and get through that. Tracy, um, I was wondering, how do you find a balance between honoring the history of the neighborhood while improving and revitalizing a space? So how do you find the balance? Um, for, for me, finding the balance is First, being open-minded about the change. A lot of people can't handle change, but change is inevitable. Want to happen whether we get on the gravy train or not. So, when our, when my neighborhood started changing, I looked around and kind of like looked at the different parts of history that was in the past, and I also looked at what what changes can become history. And I'll use the, under the Stop the Violence Mule, that partial right there will be a part of our younger generation's history. So we're teaching them how to maintain it and you know let them know this is part of the community because your community is built up of your people. The people are the community. So we know change has to happen, so we have to be open-minded to change. And we have to be very vocal and we have to listen to what that change could possibly be and mean to us. So we don't want to lose everything that's a part of our history. And if we stand by and do nothing, then we lose a part of that. So we kind of like have to give or take a little and we have to kind of figure out what exactly, what exactly is our history in the community first and what it is that we're willing to give up and be vocal about things that we don't want to give up, things that we can control. Um, just like the Stop the Violence Mural. That's a part of our history, not because it says Stop the Violence, but because of the name of the people that are on that wall. They were a part of our history. You know, it's a story behind every name. Right. Tracy, for you... Um could you give a little background to the folks in the audience um, about the Stop the Violence mural, um, just what it is, uh, what happened recently, and you know what the process was of arriving at the new mural? So that Stop the Violence um, mural, they're not just victims of homicide from the Corn Bleach area, but across communities. Um, gun violence has been around forever, and it's more aggressive now than it has been. Um, I'm a surviving homicide victim. So when that wall was put up there in, in 1989, I was 29 years old. Mm -hmm. So most of the names that are from my neighborhood I'm familiar with and the families, and some of the families are still there. So for some of the families, that's, their, that's the way they honor their loved ones. For all of the families, that's the way. Being a victim, I, I understand it more now than I did then. So when that wall went up, we wasn't in the process. Our community didn't have a say on uh, 
the design, the coloring, you know, whose name was going to be where or whatever. One day we looked up and the New York Arts Department was actually Jane was, she was painting it and putting names up. And, you know, we, we gravitated to them. We looked and we said, hey, we know this person, we know that person. They were part of our community. But when that wall came down recently, what was it, last year? So we felt like they were taking, we didn't know what the process was going to be at the time. But we thought it was just disappearing. So we were going to lose a piece of our history. And as we looked around, besides the Rockwell Top Lot, well, parks now, you know, it was something else being taken away from us. You know, here we had gentrification, and now here's a part of our history. Most people we've known all our lives being taken away from us. But this time it was different. We were at the table. We, we had say in the design process, you know, um, what was going to happen. Being a part of the being part of the process meant everything to us, where we wasn't a part of the process the first time. Um, we were for that. I, yeah, thank you, Tracy. That um, that involvement, that direct involvement in the process is um, it's something that we're really working hard to continually refine and improve. Um, and I think sometimes people are wondering how they can get involved. Um, Edwin, um, could you talk just a little bit um, about what um, you know what community members could do uh, to be involved or make change in in their community or their public space based on uh, your experience at Waterloo? I think our education is everything, and being uh, willing to come out to meetings. A lot of times, folks feel as though I've been at work all day, I've been busy. Um, I would have loved to come to the meeting, but I'm just tired. I got dinner to make. But a lot of times, if you try to schedule meetings maybe once a month, this has a big part uh, to do with your life, your community, your children. You know, don't wait to a, a crisis to happen to want to show up to a meeting. Uh, trying to motivate folks before the crisis, trying to prevent it from happening, you know, trying to give them the bigger picture. You know, uh, if you're not showing up to a a school meeting, you're not going to know what's going on. You're going to miss that graduation advice. You're going to miss that, that field trip. So basically, uh, when engaging the community is also trying to encourage them to encourage each other. Uh, uh, you know, pass that news on. Hey, they have a meeting this week. If I can't make it, can you make it? And can you bring back that information? Or if you cannot make it to that meeting, you know, show up the next day to a representative at that local rec center or to the make the world better say, hey, I missed the meeting. So is there anything, you know, I should know or or is there anything I could contribute or volunteer? It's just about getting involved and, and allowing people to take ownership, ownership of what's theirs in their community and making people feel like, you know, they exist. Once again, you know, they, they their lives exist. Exactly. This case. I would love to hear about some of the specific ways community members have provided input on the project so far at VAIR um, and how some of their ideas have been incorporated into the actual building and site design. I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you repeat <laughs> that question, awesome. please? Um, I was just wondering about like different ways, either through like the workshops or conversations that we've had at VAIR that have given community members an opportunity to provide input on the design of the building and the site, and if you've seen those reflected in the actual building and site layout. Yes, I have um, seen uh, a lot of the ideas, um, the, um, the structure of the building and everything. The community meetings are, I would say, when we had them, were great. Everybody was able to um, come in and share their ideas, not saying that everything's going to be in our new building or whatever, but just to know that you can share and say, this is what I would like, and see mm -hmm. something that that's pertaining to maybe some kind of idea that you've had you know, going to play in, you know, in our new building or whatever. And like I said, again, that 
y'all could have just came in and tore down this put up. And, you know, we wake up one day and we got a new building. But no, y'all, you know, came in and you asked for ideas and it's making the community feel like that they're a part of it. You know, I get questions that when I'm walking down the street or if I'm out, you know, cleaning about or whatever, and I get uh, people saying, well, when is the new building? I says, I'm not sure yet, but when it comes, they w and their next questions are, well, do you think? I'm like, listen, everybody had ideas in it, and if, you know, yours isn't, but some part of it will be there because you had, you know, everybody had great ideas. And, you know, with the layouts that I've seen, you know, far as the uh, layouts for the new building, whatever, I say we all have a, a little part of something in that. And I thank, you know, all of you for that. So. Thank you, Mr. From what I've seen, it's coming along. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's thank helpful you. here. <laughs> and we have, we have plenty more meetings, don't worry. Um, I'm glad you're <laughs> joining us. Um, I think we probably have time for just one last um, question, and then um, Claire's going to wrap things up. But as just a quick summary, we're receiving a lot of questions about how to get involved with MTWB, um, how you can get connected or volunteer. I think when Claire is summing things up, she will direct everyone to uh, where you can find that information. Um, so Ian, last, I think the last question, and we only have another minute or two, um, based on you know some of the feedback that Ms. Case was just giving, um, I would love to hear your thoughts on some of the early conversations that we've had with community members uh, in workshops where a lot of times we're not talking about a sports program or a public space, and we are talking about um, some, some levels of needs, safety, security, welfare. Um, could you talk about that and how that plays into your uh, design process? Yeah, I think um, so. Generally speaking, as you as you start to, you know, be in this business a little bit, you realize that you have to sort of operate in between the lines, in between the words, and sort of interpret things. Um, so you do the best you can with you know the vernacular in which you're operating in. Um, so when people talk about safety, it could be in, it could be five different things around that just don't even know yet and you're and you're and you're basically strategizing um, using something similar to the scientific method to kind of narrow down and unpack these things so you can figure out how to solve the problems um, uh, I think you know someone said it best that kind of you know frame the vernacular in which we're approaching is we're going to try to find the their flavor right it's the you know the the story that um, that in some ways, when one encounters the site, hopefully they can interpret the codes that are that are that have generated the thinking and generated the the response. And um, it comes from, I think, personally of my experience and the experience of you know, as for design is concerned. As far as design, it's it's um, the issues that one has, the problems, the. The hardships we don't design towards all the successes in one's life we design for the things that generally are aren't working very well and we want to solve those problems we're going to figure out how to do that and we want to um deliver that so i think from the point of view of what miss case talked about you know we were trying to figure out their feelings their challenges their hopes you know in some sense we're projecting in the future with regard to this optimistic out outlook you know, in some ways, not all the people that are involved right now will, will actually benefit from this. It will be people in the future. So we have to kind of anticipate what those other things might be that will generate the hopes. And, we, and, and we're really kind of looking at all the dimensions of those things like security, safety, intergenerational inter stuff, job development, um, education, um, you know, public health, future, coming back to support. Um, those are many of the concepts that we heard time and time again, and we got to continue to unpack them and talk about them and, and understand them in as many different ways as possible. Great. Thanks, everyone, so much. Um, that was a, a really interesting conversation. Um, we just want to thank everyone in the audience for your participation. 
Um, we're very appreciative of your great questions. We got through a number of them. We didn't get to all of them, um, but we were very appreciative. And to Ken, Steph, Tracy, Edwin, Miss Case, and Ian, um, members of our MTWB family, as Edwin put it so well, <laughs> uh, we're so appreciative of, the, appreciative of the work that you do on a daily basis and certainly for sharing much of this work with us today. So thank you. Um, if you would like to learn more about our work, uh, Make the World Better, um, even to donate. Thank you for the person who asked about that. We're very appreciative as well. Um, you can find us at mtwb.org. You can also reach us directly at the team at mtwb.org. Or you can find us on social media. We're at MTWB Foundation on most platforms. Um, and follow us. Maybe we'll try to get to some of those additional questions either through our blog section of our website or on social media in the coming weeks. Um, again, thank you all so much for your participation, and we hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Good thank night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank, thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.